Okay, so first I'd like to thank the organizers uh, to invite me to uh, give this talk, but also to put this uh, conference together, because I think it's a very nice thing uh, to do for people uh, working with long-range interactions. So I will present uh, collective effects in light scattering by cold atoms. Uh, so it's about long-range interactions, and I will try to motivate why it is uh, why we have long-range interactions when you scatter light on cold atoms, and uh, where exactly do you see these long-range effects? It's a bit my uh, motivation. First, I will try to explain you uh, why we have uh, a long-range interaction, a long-range problem. And uh, so, in this community, we don't speak about long-range. Uh, we speak about collective effects. And I would say, uh, or cooperative, actually. And I would say people do not differentiate yet what would be long-range, cooperative, collective. Cooperative or collective just means many-body effect. But you can have many-body effects that are uh, local. And I will try to discuss a bit what is really long-range and what would be more local. And in particular, the big difference uh, uh, I will discuss is between uh, dynamical effects and uh, space effects. Okay, so first thing, uh, why do we have a long-range many-body problem? So we send light on a large cloud of particles. Here I will consider uh, atoms, so microscopic particles, much smaller than the wavelengths. I will consider they are motionless, so no dynamics, but their dipoles uh, interact. Why? Because each time a particle uh, receives uh, light, it will scatter, it will re-radiate a spherical wave. A spherical wave decays as 1 over r, and the other particles will see this spherical wave. This means that all the particles interact together through these spherical waves, and this way you have a, sorry, a many-body long-range problem that is classical or quantum. Here I will treat everything classically and I will discuss uh, just at the last uh, slide uh, what would be the quantum aspect. But what I will do is uh, classical. So I will consider uh, two level atoms with a fixed position in space and the dynamical variable will be the atomic dipole. Beta square, so beta is the atomic dipole and beta square is the probability of my atom to be excited. And in a linear optics, it's, uh, beta is proportional to the electric field. And if you look at the dynamics of a single atom, the dynamic of the dipole, you have a decay term uh, gamma that gives the lifetime of your atomic transition. You have the detuning between the atomic transition and uh, your incident laser. So it's just a, a rotating uh, term. And then you have an open system, of course, because your atoms are emitting light. So you need to inject light. And so this is one big difference with many uh, long-range systems that has been studied. Here I will have an open system because uh, we traced over the degrees of freedom associated to the light. Okay, so this is the dynamics of a sim single atom. If you look at the dynamic of uh, my cloud with many atoms coupled, the, the term you need to add is this one. Here you are saying my uh, dipole J he also receives the spherical waves emitted by all the atoms M. And this spherical wave uh, needed to travel from atom J to atom M. And this way you get the long range coupling. It's many body because typically in a cold atomic cloud you get 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 10 uh, uh, particles. It's quite a flexible system because uh, you can experimentally, it's quite easy to tune uh, the detuning to change simply the frequency of the incident laser. You can also, uh, by changing uh, your trap, the characteristic of your trap, you can change the density and the size of your system. So it's actually quite a flexible system. Okay, and I'm in the linear optics regime. So the atoms have a linear response to the light. So this means that I just have a linear problem. Here I just have a n by n matrix. I describe my problem. So a lot of the physics will be in the eigenvalues and uh, in the eigenvectors of this matrix. 
costs. And so I will discuss especially with the uh, eigenvalues. And here, I should say it's a microscopic approach. I consider my medium as uh, made of point scatterers. And I will present another approach a bit after. I would say the hallmark of a long range effect in this system is super radiance. The original context in which super radiance was introduced was with two level atoms in the small volume limit. So you take many atoms and you put them in a volume much smaller than a wavelength. And you start with all atoms in the excited states. So the atom will start to decay, but the decay, uh, so typically one atom uh, will lose, uh, will go to the ground state, but the point is that you don't know which atom went to the ground state. So you quickly go into superpositions of state. So you go to states that are symmetric, that look like this. So here I have just three atoms. Of course, you get many possible uh, symmetric states like this if you have many atoms. And when you go from this state to this state or from this state to this state, you have actually uh, a much smaller, much faster, sorry, emission rate. Particularly in the original work by uh, Dick in 1954, uh, it showed that in this small volume limit, you expect an emission of light not at rate gamma, like a single atom, but n times gamma. It means that n atoms, strongly coupled, emit light much faster than a single atom. Um, so, and the point is that in this small volume limit, you actually have uh, kind of, you can treat the system uh, like in a mean, like defining a macroscopic mode. Because you don't uh, see anymore the effect of the distance because the atoms are in a volume smaller than a wavelength. So they just interact with a unique uh, light mode. Then if you have a large system, much larger than the wavelengths, you can still have this super radiant effect. You don't need to have the atoms very close. And in this case, it decays as n over r square. Uh, ah, here r is, uh, OK, is missing. And this is already uh, a long range effect, because if you take a fixed density and increase the system size, uh, this uh, super radiant state will, uh, rate will uh, go to infinity. OK. So I started with a quantum uh, system before because I had an all, uh, strongly uh, all my atoms excited and I decayed to, uh, to states with uh, many photons. But actually, you just need to, you can just study this problem uh, with one photon in your system, and it's called super radiance with a single photon. And already, if you send a laser on your cloud, Imagine you can uh, have a, be sure that you have a single photon when you work with uh, very low intensities. You will excite one atom, but you don't know which atom. So you will be in a superposition of state already. And because of this, you can have super radiance with a single photon. And because you have a macroscopic superposition of state. Uh, and there was a recent experiment uh, in Recife uh, uh, about this uh, aspect. And now I will focus really on linear optics. I will uh, forget about the story of superposition of state because they are not really relevant when you work with a single photon if you don't look at uh, quantum correlations. The reason why uh, it's more or less the same is because if you look at the first order uh, in a dipole uh, terms, you cannot make the difference between a superposition of state and a separable state. So now I will really discuss linear optics, the one that you learn uh, much more into undergrad uh, studies. And I will go back to my very classical equations where each atomic dipole scatters a spherical wave. So here I put back the equations with the single atom and the coupling term. And you can see I have a linear equation, so I can just look at the eigenvalues and eigenmodes of my system. The eigenvalues will be complex, and I will write them like exponential minus gamma nt minus i omega nt. So gamma n will be the decay rate of my mode, and omega n its energy. And if you look at the spectrum of this system, you get this kind of thing. So for n atoms, you get n eigenvalues. 
and it looks like this. So on the vertical axis, I have the mode lifetime. Um, actually, it's, sorry, it's a mode decay rate. So on the higher part, you have super radiance, you have very fast decay rates, which I discussed previously. This line corresponds to single atom uh, physics. And below, you have what is called subradiance, which is very long, uh, which are very long lifetimes. Okay, so since I have a couple system, I have a new, uh, many new lifetime in the system. And <clears throat> so I discussed a bit uh, super radiance, and now it's important that to understand that when you have super radiance, automatically you have long lifetimes at the same time that appear in your system. The reason for that is that when you introduce your coupling between the atoms, you do not change the trace of your matrix. So if you have uh, eigenvalues that increase because of the coupling, you need to have eigenvalues that decrease to compensate because your trace is constant independently of the coupling. So as you have super radiance uh, that appears with very fast decay rate, you also have sub radiance that have a low decay rate. And these modes uh, couple very little uh, to the wave you send, but since they are very long lifetimes, you will see them in the end. And the group, in particular, of uh, Robin Kaiser did very nice uh, theoretical and experimental work on this. In particular, recently they showed experimentally that you have this uh, subradiant rate in atomic clouds with lifetimes that increase with B0, this optical thickness. And I will come back uh, soon to this. So you have long lifetimes and short lifetimes. So, back to the long-range aspect, uh, you need always to define a thermodynamic limit if you want to discuss long-range effects. And of course, the question is, how do you define your thermodynamic limit? So here I will say, okay, I want to have a fixed density in my system. I take an homogeneous system with a fixed density and, an, and I increase the particle number to infinity. This will be my thermodynamic limit. In this context, the optical density uh, scales as the density times the size of the system, so it goes to infinity of the, in the thermodynamic limit, which means that the super radiant rate goes to infinity in the thermodynamic limit, and the sub radiant lifetimes also go to infinity in the thermodynamic limit. And so you need to uh, understand this optical thickness parameter like the cooperativity parameter in the system that, give, that tells you how strong long-range effects can be. Okay, now you say, okay, I have, uh, I describe my system with n degrees of freedom with my n particles, and the super radiance, sub radiance are clearly many body effects, but do I really need n degrees of freedom to, descri to describe them? So we want to look at alternative models to understand if we really need all these degrees of freedom, and if some simpler models can describe superradiance and subradiance, so that uh, to understand the minimal model to capture this, uh, this effect. So, uh, what you can do is to do a, a mean field approach. You take your equation and you substitute your microscopic scatterers by a continuous density. And so you rewrite your uh, atomic dipoles like a dipole field. So you replace here the field, and the sum of uh, all the possible dipole is, uh, dipoles is simply replaced by an integral with a density uh, times your spherical wave uh, with all the dipole fields. So here, since we have atoms at fixed positions, we don't have any problems of divergence when the atoms would come close or collapse. So this is a, there are no big technical problems doing this. So this will be for the dynamical uh, problem where you look at uh, dynamics, uh, dynamical effects. And you can also look at the steady state when you put this term to zero. And if you do this and you apply this operator, nabla square plus k square, you will simply obtain that your dipole field obeys uh, Helmholtz equation with a refractive index that is given by this formula with the atomic density. And this is well known that 
atomic clouds uh, at first order in linear optics uh, regimes, they behave basically as a dielectrics. They can have a lensing effect uh, and uh, such kind of effects. So I will now discuss a bit uh, some uh, phenomena in this limit of, uh, the, of a mean field approach. So first thing, the spectrum, because we said a lot of information is in the spectrum. So the microscopic one looks like this, and uh, for the field approach, it looks like this. And since you cannot see much, uh, if you do many realizations, uh, you obtain this kind of uh, spectrum. You can say, okay, the spectrum for the microscopic and the field approach are not so different. Okay, you lose a bit this branch of the spectrum. Here, the colors correspond to the participation ratio. So it means red means many atoms participate, and you expect that in the super radiant modes, many atoms participate, and the blue, few atoms participate in the mode. And overall, the two spectra look quite the same. You get a super radiant part and a sub radiant part. So maybe the field approach uh, describes well super radiance and sub radiance. Actually, if you look into more details as a super radiant part, you can show that the super radiant modes are well described by both the field approach uh, and the microscopic approach. They are very similar modes. You can also count the number of super radiant modes and you find that they scale as uh, kr squared, so like the surface of your system. But now if you look at the subradiant modes present in the field approach, you will see that you have actually only surface modes, which are uh, something very well known uh, in acoustics, especially which are called whispering gallery modes. These were first discussed in the context of a, of a dome in a cathedral where uh, you have actually some surface effects. Like if you go in this dome, you can uh, sit actually in uh, this place. Someone sitting here and someone sitting in the center uh, would not be able to communicate with each other, but because of these surface modes that exist, the communication is very easy along the corridor, along the border, uh, the surface of your, uh, of your dome. And these are the modes with very long lifetimes that we observe in the field model. They have very long lifetimes because they are reflected many times before leaking out of the system. These modes are actually not uh, relevant for atomic systems because atomic systems don't have sharp uh, transition in the refractive index because we usually have uh, traps with uh, clouds with uh, quadratic profiles or uh, Gaussian profiles, and then these modes disappear completely. Uh, but this is what we are seeing here because we took an homogeneous density, and if you don't take an homogeneous density, this mode disappears. This means that when we do the field approach, we lose the subradiance that was discussed previously. So, as a first conclusion, uh, we have super radiance, which correspond to the very fast time scales that are macroscopic modes well described by your, field, uh, by your mean field approach. And we have sub radiance, which correspond to the very slow time scales. And it's a disorder effect, and which means you need to address particle particle correlations. And coming from the long range community, uh, I think uh, it looks very similar to the situation in long-range system, uh, such, uh, such as uh, it was, for example, discussed in, um, with the HMF model uh, a lot, like the Vlasov equation, it's a mean field approach that describes the macroscopic degrees of freedom and it describes the fast time scale and quasi-stationarity corresponds to a slow time scale, and it means that you have to address the particle particle correlation to describe this. So there is this uh, really striking analogy, although it was not uh, formalized uh, yet, but that tells that maybe what we see as fast time scale and slow time scale in this uh, linear open system is something very similar to what you see in uh, more generic long range systems. So these effects are probably truly long range. Now, if we forget about the dynamics and look a bit at the steady state, uh, as I said before, we just get Helmholtz equation. So 
your dipole field obeys a wave equation in the medium with a given refractive index due to the presence of the other atoms. And this is due to the fact that in linear optics, your dipole field is uh, simply proportional to your electric field. And of course, uh, in this case, uh, you know that when you look at uh, a wave propagating in a medium, the boundary conditions play a very important role. The geometry uh, of your system is very important. One uh, extreme example is the, are these whispering gallery modes that exist only because you have boundaries in your system, but we know in general that uh, the diffraction properties of your system depend strongly on the boundaries. So one, in the steady state regime, one effect that was labeled as a collective that is actually related to this uh, refractive index, and I will present because I think it's a very interesting problem, is the one of Abraham Minkowski uh, momentum. Uh, the story is the following. So if you take a single atom and you look at the momentum it acquires uh, when it scatters light in the linear regime, in the elastic scattering regime, of course the momentum exchanges with light units of h bar uh, k where k is the wave number of uh, the system. And there was a very old debate, more than one century old, to understand whether the momentum of light in a dielectric was m h bar k, with m's index of refraction, and h bar k over m. Depending, I mean, there are arguments for both candidates, and it was a very long-living uh, debate, uh, and it's actually still active, with some papers still published on this topic about what is the correct uh, unit of momentum for light in the dielectric medium. And since atoms exchange units of uh, momentum with light, you may be tempted to use cold atoms uh, to study this problem. So a very nice answer was given by uh, Stephen Barnett uh, a few years ago, where basically it's, he said, uh, be careful to what you call momentum. You can def uh, define different momenta, like uh, the kinetic momentum, uh, the canonical momentum, and this will not give you the same answer. So depending on what you observe and how your system is done, you will get different answers. And this is why there were different experimental results. In the frame of cold atoms, which is the one I'm focusing on, it was shown already experimentally 10 years ago that the atoms acquire a uh, recoil of m h bar k. Here you have a factor two because they absorb and then re-emit the photons. So there are two events. So this is really typically a classical uh, uh, collective effect that you can understand easily with what I showed you before. So what you can show is that uh, the momentum distribution is just a Fourier transform in space of the dipole field. And if you accept uh, this, uh, this formula that I give you, then since you know that the dipole field propagates like a wave in the dielectric with the refractive index, the Fourier transform of this will simply be a momentum distribution uh, where the refractive index will appear. So it tells you that uh, the atoms will exchange unit of momentum of m h bar k. And you can even calculate in more detail uh, the momentum uh, pattern. So this is really a nice example of collective effect where due to the presence of the other atoms, uh, the atoms, each atom exchange a unit of uh, momentum with light, a quantity of momentum with light that is not H bar K but modified by the presence of the neighbors. Okay, so this refractive index is collective in a sense that it's a many, many body uh, effect, but I would say it's not long range because it doesn't uh, diverge uh, in the thermodynamic limit. And it's uh, as soon as you speak about a refractive index, you can think of uh, this discussion about additivity. If you just take two pieces of dielectric of index M and glue them or separate them, you still get a dielectric of index M. So M is, um, is an intensive uh, uh, quantity. And what changes when you put your pieces together are just the boundary conditions. So of course, and then you go back to diffraction. And you know that diffraction is very sensitive to boundary conditions and geometry. For example, 
a cube of dielectric doesn't scatter light like a sphere of dielectric. Uh, it strongly depends on the shape. Still, I would say this is not really a long-range effect. Uh, I would say when you speak of these collective effects, you must be careful that you're not simply doing diffractions, like it was sometimes done in the past. Both effect long-range systems and diffraction problems uh, share a sensitivity to boundary conditions. But overall, I would say these are quite uh, different uh, problems. So this was for the mean field approach. And then you may uh, want to go back to disorder to say, OK, so this is not captured by your mean field approach. And it corresponds to a disorder effect. And if you think of long lifetimes and disorder, you should think of Anderson localization, because these are two ingredients. Uh, that can tell you that you have Anderson localization. When it comes to light in 3D, Anderson localization has been very controversial. Uh, and uh, a very recent paper published in January of this year summarizes uh, this well by saying uh, Anderson localization of light in 3D has still not been observed yet. In particular, there were some experimental claims the authors of these papers, of these experimental papers, themselves uh, recognize that what they observed was not under some localization of light. And in particular, uh, recent theoretical works uh, showed that probably the near field effects uh, may be responsible for the absence of localization. Because indeed, as you know well, uh, light is a vectorial wave. It's not simply a spherical wave with a rotational symmetry. You have polarizations, you have electric field and magnetic field. And if you look at your coupled equations, you need now to consider not only beta j, but beta j uh, alpha with alpha equal to x, y, z. And you get a coupling term where you have your spherical wave as before, but you have new terms. That scale has 1 over kr square and 1 over kr cube. These are still uh, long range terms because they are 1 over kr uh, square and 1 over kr cube in 3D. So this one is marginally long range. But the fact is that uh, the breaking of the symmetry of the coupling leads to a reduction of the dipole dipole uh, correlation. So this actually breaks your collective effects. People tend to say, OK, but if I'm dilute, uh, if each atom is far from his neighbor and I still have a very large system, I can neglect these terms. But this is not always true. And the reason is that they are long, still long range terms. So if you uh, look at them of a very large size for your systems, they may still be important because they have a diverging uh, contribution in the thermodynamic limit. One uh, well-known uh, example is that in the case of superradiance, like he introduced in the beginning, since you have in a very small volume, these terms actually do become important. And they uh, generate what is called van der Waals uh, dephasing. And the consequence is that you don't observe a rate n gamma like you would expect from superradiance, but you observe a uh, superradiant rate that is uh, much smaller than what you expect, just because of this new term. But are still long range, but they break some symmetry, and it makes the things more complicated. So back to localization, we decided to go for a 2D system. Uh, and the reasons for this is that, first, 2D systems allows for uh, study of systems much larger than uh, 3D systems. Because if you have 10,000 particles you can simulate in your computer, in 2D is much larger systems than in 3D. You don't have problems of critical density to reach the Anderson localization regime. And uh, what is very important for us is that we have a regime of scalar scattering and a regime of vectorial scattering. Yeah. Uh, and uh, because we have two decoupled subsystems in 2D. And this will give rise to a localized, Anderson localized regime and uh, a regime without Anderson localization. So, very briefly, in 3D, uh, vectorial light couples all uh, sub levels of your atomic transition, while in 2D, if you really go to a 2D vacuum, you will decouple some transition, and so you will get vectorial scattering. Versus scalar scattering. 
if you put this into equations, you get this equation uh, for the scalar scattering where L0, the Yankel function, is basically the spherical wave but in 2D, so it decays as one over the square root of r. And for the vectorial one, you get this uh, spherical waves in 2D plus some near field terms. And so the story is that if you look at the spectrum uh, as before, so here is single atom uh, physics. So you have again super radiance and uh, very strong sub radiance for scalar scattering. But if you look at vectorial scattering, you get super radiance and a much weaker sub radiance. This subradiance is actually a very well-known uh, effect called radiation trapping. It's just the fact that you have a photon in the middle of your cloud. You have a very large cloud. So before being able to escape from the cloud, the photon will be scattered many times. But for this, you don't need uh, coherences between the atomic dipoles. Uh, you don't even uh, need disorder. So this is, I would say, uh, not at all the physics of uh, Anderson localization. And it's, a, it's something that can be easily understood with a random walk of photon models. So you can already see a big difference uh, in the spectrum. Now, if you want to really characterize uh, your uh, Anderson localization, uh, to say if you have Anderson localization of, or not, you should do two things. You should look at your modes. And we observe, indeed, that the scalar light has very well exponentially localized modes in space. So this is a typical mode with a logarithmic scale of its uh, spatial profile. You see that it's very localized with an exponential shape. And if you look at vectorial model, you will not see any exponentially localized mode, only some extended modes uh, that are a bit subradiant, but nothing localized. So apart from this uh, inspection of the modes, you should also do a scaling analysis that I will not uh, present here, but that was uh, introduced by Abram. And uh, with this, you can confirm that only scalar light exhibits Anderson localization and vectorial light doesn't. It means that in 3D, it's, I mean, it's in agreement with the 3D results. Vectorial light, which is uh, the only physical light, uh, doesn't exhibit Anderson localization for point scatterers. And if you reach a scalar model, then you may have uh, Anderson localization. OK. So this was a bit for Anderson localization, but what we were interested in uh, was also understanding the connection between trapping in time, which is subradiance, and trapping in space, which is a localization. So we took again our eigenmodes and eigenvalues, and now what I plot is the localization length of the modes here on the x-axis and the lifetime of the modes, uh, the inverse lifetime, the decay rate. Uh, and the color corresponds to the distance to the cloud center. So actually, these modes uh, of these columns are the quite well uh, localized mode with some exponential uh, decay. And what is very interesting to see is that, OK, you have a quite well defined localization length. But the lifetime of the mode seems to be quite independent from the localization length. Well, in general, you would expect that the more localized you are in space, uh, the longer the lifetime of your mode. But this is not true, actually. The lifetime seems to be quite independent from the localization length of your, um, of your mode. And um, another thing that you can see is that uh, when you go in this red region, means when you go to the boundary of the cloud, your localization length uh, increases uh, drastically, means you are less and less localized. It means that spatial localization is very sensitive to boundary uh, effects, while here you don't have this problem, uh, meaning you have very long lifetimes, very close to the border of the cloud. So spatial localization is sensitive to boundary conditions, temporal localization is not. So this suggests that dynamical effect and space effect are very different. And then if you look, if you try to understand what is the scaling of the localization length and of the longest lifetime in your system, you obtain two, very, two different scaling. You can show that the localization length scales as the density of your system. 
It means you go to the thermodynamic limit at constant density, your localization length is well defined. Your mode lifetime, however, exhibit the scaling n two thirds over r. So it means it scales actually as a density times n power one third. It means that in the thermodynamic limit, your lifetime uh, diverges to infinity. It means, again, uh, it's a, a bit the same conclusion as before. If you look at space effects, you don't have any problem of a thermodynamic limit. So I would say it's not really a long-range effect because you expect some problems in the thermodynamic uh, limit for long-range uh, effect. But if you look at dynamics, then you get problems. So maybe uh, the signatures of the long-range effect are in the dynamics. Okay, so this is what I uh, just said, that probably the true long-range effects uh, appear uh, to be the dynamical effects, which are in particular super radiants and uh, sub -radiants. If you look at the steady state of the stationary problem, you can show that uh, actually it's, most, it's mostly about diffraction, Anderson localization, shadow effect that was mentioned uh, yesterday, and then boundary can play a very important role. What I didn't discuss here is that there were other effects that are called uh, collective in the, um, in the community, like the collective modification of the radiation pressure force exerted by the light on a cloud, the collective frequency shift. But actually, it goes back to the same uh, thing. Like, if you look at steady state effects, it's mostly an effect of density. It depends on density, and so you don't have a problem in the thermodynamic limit for fixed density. Okay, so the perspectives, if you want to go on with long range uh, effects with, uh, with these uh, cold atom systems uh, for motionless atoms, you could say, okay, one very interesting topic, and we had a very nice uh, talk yesterday about this, is dynamics of correlations. And probably since it's a dynamical effect, you expect some nice uh, long range effect. Okay, one problem in cold atoms is uh, that it's, uh, for large clouds, it's very difficult to address the atoms. Usually what uh, we are good at in cold atoms is collecting the light coming out from the system, but probing the atoms is much more of a problem. But then the interesting part is that quantum optics uh, naturally addresses uh, several dynamical uh, phenomena uh, especially if you look at optical coherences. So optical coherences, for example, the first optical coherence uh, basically corresponds to the fluorescent spectrum. You strongly drive your system and you look at the frequencies scattered by your system. And then you look actually at the correlations between events, events uh, the field emitted at time t and at time t plus tau. So already you will get an uh, interesting signature of uh, the dynamics of your system, of the correlation between events at time t and t plus tau. And you also have the second order optical coherence, which corresponds to photon bunching and anti bunching, which uh, gives you correlations between intensity and time t and time t plus tau. So let's say for long range effects, this is probably a very promising uh, direction uh, in, uh, for uh, light scattering in cold atoms. I would just like to conclude with an announcement because we are in uh, ICTP and as was uh, mentioned a few days ago, in Sao Paulo we have a cousin of ICTP, the ICTP SAIF, which organizes uh, schools. And we will organize such a school on interaction of uh, light with cold atoms uh, next uh, year. But I mean, in general, it's, it's a structure that organizes a school uh, mostly for uh, South American students, plus uh, some uh, students uh, from outside South America. And so if you know anyone interested by this school or by organizing schools uh, there, uh, there is this structure in uh, Sao Paulo. So thank you.